Please pray with me. God, I pray now that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all your people's hearts would be pleasing and acceptable to you, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. We love you. We know that you love us. Speak to us now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, raise your hand if you've ever missed a bus or a train before. I'm just curious. Pretty universal experience. It's a sinking feeling, isn't it? Maybe you missed the T connection that you had to make to be on time, and it was the one time that the T was on time that week. Uh, also bad is missing a flight. I have been that movie character before that is rushing to catch a plane and gets right to the gate only to see it taxiing away, and it was too late. That happened to me. Uh, once I missed a flight for a super important family event. It was a terrible feeling, and amazingly, I was able to rebook for free with a different airline and get back to my family on time. This was before 9-11 when everything changed in airports and it was easier to do stuff like that then. It is a miracle. It was amazing. Uh, another time, I'm sure we could all share our stories. Uh, another time early in our marriage, Sarah and I had to catch a flight out of Chicago. We lived in the DC suburbs at the time and Sarah's dad got us to the airport on time with time to spare only for us to realize that we were at the wrong airport. Chicago has two, O'Hare and Midway. So miraculously, due to some extreme but safe driving from Sarah's dad, we made it across the city and still caught our flight. That situation went from awful and we missed it to awesome and we were there, everything worked. I will never forget being in that moment. And it's a, a crummy feeling to miss something important, whether that's planes, trains, and automobiles, or some other important event. Maybe something really exciting happened at a party that you chose not to go to. We remember big life events, good ones and bad ones, usually for the rest of our lives. If I say Game 7, Red Sox and Yankees, you can probably go back to, what was that, 2004 and remember where you were. Uh, the election night speech by our country's first black president, you probably remember that as well. 9-11, Boston Marathon 2013, sirens going off. That weekend in mid-March 2020 when we closed things down for two weeks or so. That time you 311'd that giant pothole that you kept getting your tires damaged by and the city came and filled it? There's something about just being there in those huge moments that really helps us appreciate life in all of its fullness. We love to, to be there. I was there when. There's a outdoor education program called La Vida. It's connected to Gordon College up in Wenham. And if you do any activities with La Vida, whether a week-long wilderness thing or just an afternoon high ropes course, if you do anything with them, you're going to hear somebody say, be here now. Be here now. You might ask, what time is it? Be here now. You might be out in the wilderness bushwhacking. How much farther? Be here now. What's for dinner? Be here now. This works for family life, kind of. Be here now. Don't miss this important moment that you're in. There's a beautiful song that asks about be here now. You might have heard it or sung it at some point this week. It's about Jesus' death on the cross. And that song is, were you there when they crucified my Lord? Were you there? Were you being there then? <laughs> Did you be here now when they crucified my Lord? Were you there when they crucified my Lord? Oh, sometimes it causes me to tremble. Were you there when they crucified my Lord? 
that song brings to life that real historical event where some of Jesus' followers and own family members were actually present. You know they were talking about that for years to come. Where, where were you on the day of Jesus' crucifixion? Oh, I, I remember it vividly. I was there. But I was across town. They would never forget that moment. Jesus was sentenced to die for claiming to be God, for saying he was able to forgive a person's sins, for calling people to come and follow him, leave their old way of life behind, come into the abundant life. He, he got killed for all that. And so many people were there when it happened. We try to enter into that with them through that song. Were you there when they nailed him to the tree? Were you there when they pierced him in the side? Sometimes it causes me to tremble. Were you there? The soldiers were there. They mocked him. Later, they split up his clothing amongst themselves. A guy named Simon of Cyrene was there. He carried Jesus' cross. Luke says a large crowd trailed behind Jesus, including many grief-stricken women. They were all there when they killed Jesus. And then two other criminals were there, one on each side, when they crucified Jesus. Pontius Pilate was there. He put a sign on the cross, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. And Luke says all his acquaintances, all his Facebook friends, including the women who had followed him from Galilee, they stood at a distance watching these things. And there was a Roman centurion there. After he watched Jesus, this soldier in charge of people, he, he watched Jesus breathe his last and die. And this centurion said, surely this man was innocent. And truly this man was the son of God. Many people were there. This was a public execution. And perhaps most poignantly, Jesus' own mother, Mary, was there, watching her son die. The song, in its last verse, invites us to imagine, were you there when they laid him in the tomb? Were you there when they laid him in the tomb? Oh, sometimes it causes me to tremble, tremble, tremble. Were you there when they laid him in the tomb? And the answer to that is yes, there too. Joseph of Arimathea, was there a rich man and a disciple of Jesus who took the body down from the cross? Can you even imagine what that was like? And then with Nicodemus and others, they wrapped the body up and they placed it in the tomb. And this was like a big section of cave, like a, like a walk-in closet version of a tomb. Huge rock rolled against the door. They were there when they laid him in the tomb. And so was Mary Magdalene and another Mary. They had a lot of Marys back then. They were all there when they buried our Lord in the tomb. So if the question is, were you there when they crucified my Lord? Yeah, everyone was there. Not very many people missed that when it happened. So many witnesses, so much sadness, and so much certainty that, yeah, Jesus is really dead. We saw it. My aunt saw it. My neighbor next door that I haven't seen in a while, they saw it too. It happened. Not comatose, not on life support, not half dead, not just bruised and, and battered. Dead. To, to quote Charles Dickens, old Jesus was dead as a doornail. That was it. He, he was gone. And everyone was there for that life-altering event. Uh, now, you'll notice that lovely song, Were You There?, it ends at the tomb. It stops there. There's no verse that's like, were you there uh, when my Lord was resurrected, or however you would phrase that beautifully. That's not in the song. It, were you there when they crucified my Lord, when they nailed him to the cross, when they laid him in the tomb? Was Jesus' mother at the resurrection? Were the women and the other disciples? Were the crowds at the resurrection? Well, yeah, they're in the story. We heard about them today. And they're going to see the resurrected Jesus eventually. But they actually come to the tomb after the resurrection has taken place. It already happened. 
You ever get somewhere late and something has already happened, like you're there for a surprise party and everyone already jumped out and said surprise? Are you still going to go to the party? You just missed the good part. So they missed a big part of the action. Let's look again at our reading. It's, it's right in the middle of your bulletin if you want to follow along. Verse 1, when the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and Salome, bought spices so that they might go and anoint him. And very early, it says, on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. Now, they were at the tomb before, so nothing should be different right now. And they were faithful to this Sabbath requirement to not anoint a dead body on the Sabbath. Sabbath is over now, it's Sunday morning, and so here they come. That's why they're there, that's what they're doing. Verse 3, they had been saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance to the tomb? Now for us, when we say the stone has been rolled away, if you spent any time in the church or even just another Easter service, when we say the stone has been rolled away, that's like saying Christ is risen. But for them, the stone needed to be rolled away so they could get to a dead body. That's what was behind the stone, as far as they knew. But, verse 4, when they looked up, they saw that stone, which was very large, had already been rolled back. Verse 5, as they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe, sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. First of all, the stone is rolled away. No easy feat. Probably take three or four super dedicated CrossFit members to do that. Second of all, there's now a live person in the tomb. That's not usual. Um, Third, that live person is not Jesus. So how did this other guy get in there? What's he doing? And, And fourth, this guy's just sitting there. Like, is he just hanging out. It just said he was sitting on the right side. Like, what's on the right side of the tomb? He's got, like, this little uh, little table, his, his Stanley water bottle, and he's just hanging out, waiting for them to jump out. I, we don't know. We could speculate. But it's a big surprise, and it's an amazing outcome. I would imagine these women would have been uh, just as happy if the story stopped at the stone being rolled away, because now they can go anoint the body and give it a proper burial. That's important. When we lose someone, we want to grieve properly and fully. And that would have been a pretty good day for them, you know, given the circumstances. But Jesus isn't even dead now. He's alive. So go tell everyone you know. Death has been defeated. Your sins are forgiven. Jesus has all the power over everything, and he's giving that power to everyone who believes. That's the Easter story. But what I find so fascinating is that all those people, even the same women who were there when they crucified my Lord, they were not there when God resurrected my Lord. Like the resurrection itself, when that actually happened, nobody was there. Maybe maybe the guards, Matthew talks about some guards being there. I don't know, maybe they got knocked out before the resurrection happened. So many people there at the crucifixion, no one there for the actual resurrection. No disciples, no families, not even these faithful women, not Peter, not the Roman centurion who said, surely this is the son of God. These women come on to a scene where Jesus has already gotten up. He's already resurrected. That's already in the past tense. That's why the angel says he has risen. It already happened. The flight's already out of the gate. This work happened without you is the most important event in all of human history and all of Jesus's people missed it in the exact moment that it happened. The stone was already rolled away. The tomb was already empty. Jesus was somewhere alive. The resurrection had already happened when the women got there. And they noticed it, but after the fact. So I think there's actually a big encouragement here for us because we weren't actually at the crucifixion we weren't actually at the resurrection we have the stories though 
and, and nobody was at the actual resurrection, and that's okay. The women came onto a scene where the stone was rolled away, the tomb was empty, and Jesus was gone, but it was not too late for them. They might have thought they missed something big, but they were just beginning. The angel says, he has been raised, he is not here. Look, there is the place where they had put him. It's an invitation. Come and see. Behold, that wonderful King James biblical word, behold, Jesus risen from the dead. The disciples weren't there in the moment of the resurrection. How many people missed even seeing this empty tomb? It came after the fact, but even for us, that invitation 2,000 years later still stands. Behold, come and see. It's not too late even now to look in faith on the risen Jesus. That means for those of us who were not there, we have this invitation too, to look on the risen Jesus even if you missed it, even if you haven't believed yet. You might have missed the resurrection of Jesus the last time somebody was talking to you about it, or maybe the last Easter service you went to. Maybe it didn't resonate with you. Maybe you feel like it's too late, like you, you missed your flight, and Jesus is off and running, and you sort of made a decision about that already, and, well, that's that. But that angel's invitation still stands today. And that invitation is, look, come and see, behold, check it out. It's not too late to look in faith on the risen Jesus. So be here now. We, we only have this moment. We only have this day. We only have right now. We may miss important events and invitations. Like the women and the other disciples, we may have been off somewhere else doing something else when God was doing some really important work. Sometimes we get preoccupied. Sometimes we don't notice. But we forget. Maybe like these women at first, we didn't realize coming back from the dead was even a thing. But Christ is risen. Christ is risen. He is not here. He is risen just as he said he would. And so you and me and all of us now, whether we have believed this our whole lives, whether we are just starting to believe, whether we're not sure we'll ever believe, to all of us now, this invitation still stands. Behold, come and see. Check it out. Come and see the risen Jesus today. God still moves boulders. Jesus is still alive. An angel still called to us and say, come and see the risen Lord. You're not too late. You didn't miss it. This isn't too little, too late. There's no such thing. Not with Jesus. The resurrection is for any of us who would be here now with Jesus. I think the elephant in the room is verse 8 in this passage. So they went out and fled from the tomb, for terror and amazement had seized them, and they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. The end. What an odd conclusion to the resurrection story. And in fact, if you look in your Bibles, you'll see notes that are like, other manuscripts have this ending because they added to it because nobody thought this was the actual ending. Because it's very strange. Their response, the angel says, behold the risen Lord, come and see, and they, they run away. And they clam up. Maybe we can relate to that. Maybe that's like, yeah, I, I get it. I, I've done that before. I'll probably do it again. I'm doing it right now. Maybe we can really relate. Eventually, these women would share the good news or we wouldn't have this story. Somehow the word got out. But I wonder if Mark isn't winking at us readers today, saying, what will your response be? How will you respond? Will you run away in fear? Will you don't say nothing to nobody? Or will you respond in faith to the risen Lord? 
think Mark leaves us with that question. Like, what would I do if I had been in that situation? But we are here right now hearing about the resurrection of Jesus. So that's the question. What are we going to do? We are all looking together on an empty tomb, and we're hearing an angel saying, he is not here, he has risen. How will we respond? Will we respond in faith? Will we say, yes, risen Jesus, I want to be here now, fully alive with you? Let's pray together. God, I thank you for these women who found courage, their faithfulness to go to the tomb in the first place to seek after you. God, I thank you for the resurrection. I thank you for this strange, white-robed person, angel, we think, who even today is inviting us to come and see. So God, we are here. We are here right now. I pray that you would give us eyes of faith to see you risen Jesus. To see you in your power and your glory. And you don't call us to an unquestioning faith. It, there's going to be lots of uh, times you show up after the resurrection now to multiple disciples. And you've shown up to, to us over the years. And 2,000 years since then, lots of times that the risen Lord has appeared, and we praise you for that. God, help us to see you. Help us to receive you. God, we may not have been there now, but we, we may not have been there then, but we are here now. Thank you that you, risen Jesus, are here with us as well.